Well, welcome Celebration family. Today is Leftover Sunday. So we're going to reheat some amazing testimonies, some miracles that God has already done in some lives here at Celebration Church, and you're going to be able to peer into those miracles in just a moment. But before we do, let's jump into our Celebration News. Good morning, Celebration Church, and welcome to Leftover Sundays. Before we get into some amazing testimonies, I want to give you some Celebration news. If you're a first-time viewer here at Celebration Church, we want to let you know that we're so glad you're with us, and we want to get to know you. All you have to do is fill out an online connect card in the link in the description below, and we'll get you a free coffee. Why haven't I done that? Well, Ricardo, it's because you came to Celebration Church before we started doing that. And either way, you were like three at the time. If you want to join us in person, on Sunday mornings, we have two services, one at 9.30 and one at 11.15 at 2121 Caldwell Boulevard. I hope to see you there. Giving Hope was an absolute success. In our partnership with Willow Creek Elementary, we were able to give about 50 boxes of overflowing food to our community. Thank you to all of those who helped make this happen. It's because of viewers like you. Thank you. In the new year, we want to encourage you to consider taking your next step of faith as you step into the new year. And we're providing a lot of opportunities to do that. We're starting all of these in the new year. We have 21 days of prayer and fasting coming up on January 10th. We have our following Jesus class if you're a new believer. We have baby dedications coming up on January 24th. And we have our Story of God intensive at the beginning of February. You can sign up for all of these at our website, thecelebration.church. Celebration Church is hosting a night to shine. This is a wonderful way we can serve people in our community. If you don't know what a night to shine is, it's an unforgettable prom night experience centered on God's love for people with special needs. For the safety of all of our honored guests and volunteers, Night to Shine 2021, we're doing a drive through celebration and a virtual experience. There's two ways you can get involved. First, you can help volunteer for this event. Second, if you're an individual with special needs, 14 and up, we want you to be our honored guest on February 12th. Whether you're planning to be a guest or a volunteer, sign up at our website under the Night to Shine tab. If you want to keep up with us and all of our updates, make sure to follow us on social and sign up for our email newsletters on our website. And that's what's happening at Celebration Church. Let's continue to love God, love people, and change the world. Now let's pass it to Pastor Roger. Hey Ricardo, thank you. You always do such a good job at Celebration News. Church, listen, today is uh, Leftover Sunday. And Leftover Sunday is a time when uh, people within our church are giving us some of the most precious things that they have. Uh, it is their testimony. It's something that I, I hold dear. And it's, it's actually, when you hear these testimonies, you're going to realize what an honor and what a privilege it is to be in the kind of church where people are willing to share such deep, meaningful stories. Because it really, it impacts me every time I hear these stories. I want to encourage you, though, if you have children that you feel might be sensitive to um, someone, a, a, an adult being very open about their testimony. Uh, it may get a little bit PG, not 13, but just a little bit, um, just real stories. And if that concerns you and you want to uh, have your kids go to the other room, that's fine. I would do that right now. Um, but today we are honored and we're blessed to have some people who are sharing with us their stories. You know, there's this incredible passage where, where the disciples, they're hungry, and they, they tell Jesus, they say, uh, Jesus, what, what are we going to do? We're, we're hungry. Again, again, we're hungry. And Jesus says, um, weren't you there for the feeding of the 5,000? There was 12 baskets left over. And then he says, weren't you there for the feeding of the 4,000? There was seven baskets left over. He says, don't you know by now that there will always be enough? And, and I, think, um, I think that's the beauty of these testimonies, is our friends and family within the church who have experienced difficulty and the Lord has provided, whether it's a physical need or whether it's an emotional need or just a miracle from the Lord, the miraculous transformation that happens isn't just something that happens in a period of time. It's, a, it's something that always leaves leftovers, baskets left over that bless not only the person who experienced the miracle, but when they hold it in a way that we can also uh, see what God has done, 
it touches us and it blesses us. And I want to encourage you today. Um, if you uh, hear these testimonies and at some point during the testimony, you just feel like the Lord calling you to surrender something to him. That's the point of this. We're told that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies. And so today uh, there's power behind these stories. Our first testimony uh, or leftover miracle comes from uh, Aaron Ingstrom, who's a, been a, a, just a fantastic uh, landmark in our church. Love the Ingstrom family. So proud of Aaron for uh, being willing to share his story and bless us today. Uh, my name's Aaron Ingstrom. Um, my story started when I was about eight and I was molested by a family member. And it was, I wanted to say brutal, but it was devastating. So I grew up in a really good family and I had this really solid base, you know, this, this, this eight years of growing and life and was awesome and wonderful. And I had this happen and it was one of those things where you come out of it and you're kind of lost. Like you feel shaken to your core and life, uh, it, it takes on a different meaning and color. And um, I was overwhelmingly, I was embarrassed and shameful. And, and these were all things that I put on myself. No one put those there. I never spoke to my parents about it. I never talked to my family about it. I just hid it. And as time went by and I started to grow up and I started to hit puberty, um, there was a lot of questions about sexuality, about what is it. And if that happened, like, you know, in your mind, you know that that is, was wrong, but you felt like there was no control. Right? So you're out of control that way. And it just, it was a very tumultuous time for me. So I just kind of shoved it away and didn't talk about it. And I started to get into sports and started to really be active. The more active I was or, or working on the farm and stuff, if I was doing stuff like that, then I didn't have to think about it. And as I got a little bit older in my teen years into the later high school years, I really started to become angry. I felt um, without really going back to the day of and thinking about it all the time, I was just, it was there, it was nagging, it was, it was always there and I just got, I got angry. And a lot of that anger came out in what I thought God wanted for my life, like purpose. I thought, well, you know what? I'm gonna go in the military. I'm gonna become like, no one will ever be able to do that again, ever. Nor will I allow that to happen to anybody else. So on the side of like, how do you recover out of that from a sexual standpoint, you know, it was, everything was over sexualized. So I got into pornography and that became a very, very controlling vice in my life. Um, unrealistic expectations. Um, at the time I wasn't dating anybody. Um, and then I decided that I had this longing in my heart. I always wanted to have kids and I always wanted to be married. So I had that longing in my heart. And that came from a pure place, a place of just, this is what I want to do and this is who I want to be. And that was a good thing. But the way I went at it was how many people could I date and how much of, uh, how suave could I be and how, and it was all fake. It was just, you know, it was a facade. And so I dated all these girls and I thought that that was the way to find people and, and God had a bigger plan, a better plan for me. And that's when he introduced me to my wife and actually my wife's brother introduced us because she saw me, I was a military guy at their church and she saw me and she was like, I'm gonna marry that guy. That's what she told her mom and I had no clue. And she would do things like sit behind me and I was supposed to turn around and be like, oh my gosh, like you're amazing, you're like oh, I was foxy. But I was so, I wasn't in the right mind set. Like I, I was hunting, I wasn't being hunted. I was gonna go find a wife. And God's like, you know, he's like, you're dumb, you know? So, <laughs> so I walked over and the minute I, I saw her, I was like, not suave, not cool, not, you know, 
So I got uh, Annie and I. We from the very beginning, we loved each other. From the very we both knew that we were gonna get married. And I actually asked her dad. I think a couple months after we'd been dating, I was like, "Can I marry your daughter?" And, <laughs> and Steve was like, "Um, yeah. Oh, you know, let's think about. It. Let's slow down a little bit. Let's, you know." <laughs> I was like, maybe tomorrow, this hour, you know, I was like, so we ended up getting married about a year later. I went on a deployment, came back and we got married and, um, she's amazing and wonderful. And if you know anything about my wife, she's just a lover. Her heart is pure. She's like one of the people that I've met in my life who are genuinely wholesome, just truly just wonderful people. So I was married to this amazing woman and we started having kids and I had all these unrealistic expectations from pornography. What was sex? How did it happen? How did, what did it involve? And my wife, um, and this breaks my heart because my wife ended up taking the brunt of that feeling inadequate. I'd say, um, there was a big, like, Un uncovering like that whole thing came out and um, my wife felt betrayed because um, even though you're not cheating with somebody else that's that's cheating because you're giving your heart uh, and your body to something other than your wife and so Annie and I sat down and we talked and we I ended up talking Annie was the first person I've ever talked to about being molested and when it came out, it was like, <laughs> it was like a bomb went off in my, in my soul. And all of that stuff I had pushed away had just, it came out and I was broken and I, it was tough because I felt so much hurt about it that I had hurt other people because of it when you push that away and God softens your heart and he pulls you out of it and he starts to say you're you're just dirty you're muddy you're and I want to clean you and I want to make you better and so we ended up finding a I ended up finding at a church that we went to um, a counselor who he it wasn't his specialty but he was developing that as his specialty because he saw such a need for men and so we were in on the room and there were some guys whose stories were so um, tragic and, and horrid. And, and so what happened was you, you opened yourself, you shared, and then you became compassionate for those around you, seeing that you're all broken, you're all running the same gauntlet of life from that perspective. And so we went on the room and shared and I remember walking away from that first day going, I can, I can kind of breathe a little bit better. I felt like I had hope. I, it was overwhelming at first, but all of a sudden I felt like I had like a renewed energy. But here my wife was, hadn't gone, th she's going through these grieving processes of dealing with a husband who had a severe pornography addiction and, and unrealistic expectations. And then for her, I'm going through all these things and I'm feeling better about it, but she's not able to go through it. The pornography addiction was one of the hardest things to get rid of because um, it's always it's always around you. It's always prevalent. It's in advertising. It's everything, you know, and so you're constantly bombarded. And so there were days when you would fail and there was days and weeks and months where you were awesome and wonderful. And so going through that, that roller coaster those first couple of years was that was taxing, like very taxing. So I ended up. Um, we started to get better and God started to heal me from the inside out. At the same time, I was going through some struggles with my, I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, I was loved and supported as far as like, you know, you need to make your choice and, and search God out. I went through this really tough time of, is God real? And I was like, you know, I'm a scientific brain guy. Like I, I, I'm a thinker. Like I want to know. I, my dad and I had a conversation and I said, I'm just having this thing like, I don't know if God's real. And my dad said, what do you think God's afraid of you proving him wrong? <laughs> he's like, I, he's like, you need to do it. Like, go prove him, like test him. 
and he will show himself. And so I went through this whole um, period of where I would just pray nonstop, non-ceasing. Just my prayer life became conversational. Instead of like, Lord, if thou willest, I would become a better man. Like it was more like, I'm struggling, Lord. Like he's my friend and he's sitting here and he's listening to me and he's my comforter and he's my guide and he's my rock. I remember I had a moment in my car, I was driving to work and I had to pull off the side of the road because I had a, a Holy Spirit moment that just blew me away where I was like, there is no doubt in my mind that God is real and there is no doubt that God is working in my life. And it was so overwhelming. I just cried like a baby and it was so awesome and wonderful. And that was the moment I think that I just connected myself to the Lord and said, from here on, there will be no separation between us because I don't want to be separated from you. In the past, probably four to five years, God has taken us to another level of relationship where, um, we're, you know, there's that saying, you know, bone of bone, flesh of flesh kind of thing. And you're always like, oh, that's neat and lifty, you know. And, and until that becomes reality, you'll never know what marriage, why God planned marriage for us. This whole process has been so amazing and wonderful. And I felt probably six years ago or so, I felt God's urging to reach out to other men. Um, I always think of it like when you're walking through a battlefield, you don't want to do it by yourself. If I don't have men to my front, to my left, to my right, to my rear, like I'll have, I'm more open and susceptible to attack. So I like to think of it like guarding myself by keeping strong people around me and they don't have to be strong at everything. It's just, you recognize strength or love immediately once you've gone through really horrible things. I mean, King David gave us such a great example of having a, a man who was close and a brother to you, right? It's close and a brother to you. Like it was, it was amazing, their relationship, because when they came together, they saw that everything I go through, you go through. Everything that you go through, I go through. I know you intimately because we walk the same battle every day. Like who better to know the physical battle uh, the mental battle of pornography than another man who has gone through it as well. So if I create that close knit group and that, and that emotional connection, like it's such a great stepping point to communication about things. Because when you feel like you're connected to somebody, you will open up more to them and you can talk freely about things and know he loves me. There's nothing that I can do that will change that. And because we're in this solid, amazing relationship, we now will lift each other up and I'm going to watch his six and I'm going to remind him, Hey, you be careful of that. Or how's it going? How are you doing? And those are crucial. And the more open you are with each other, when you do say, Hey, how are you doing today? You know, it's not the canned, Oh, I'm doing good. Or oh, life's a little bit, you know, it's more purposeful. You may start with things are good. And then you may contemplate and you may go, but I, I'm struggling a little bit. You know, I've been clean and sober for 20 years and my coworkers were drinking the other day and that was a tough, that was a tough run for me. And you go, oh man, I hear you. So that's a big part of the healing process that has happened is ministering to other men. So it's been good. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Listen, I've always respected your willingness to get rid of the mask and talk about what's really going on inside. And if you're a man that's watching this and you're just thinking, I want that kind of transformation too, I wanna let you know Celebration Church is going to be hosting a new ministry this coming year where men are able to take down those barriers and really deal with what's going on inside. It's an offsite event where only 12 men are allowed to come. Our first time is gonna be April 28th to May 2nd. And I wanna invite you, if you're looking for transformation and you're a man, you need to come to the return, April 28th to May 2nd. Our next testimony is from someone who, if you have not met her yet, you're missing out because she's fun, she's smiley, she's bubbly, and she's got a powerful testimony. Her name is Lacey Bean. 
Hi, my name is Lacey Bean, and this is my testimony. So I grew up in Texas, and that means my father was raised in the generation where men are not taught how to handle their emotions, handle their feelings, express any kind of emotion at all, um, especially crying. So this left my father as a very emotionally detached person. So as a little girl, I had a huge desire to have love, affection, affirmation from my father. And because he was so emotionally detached, that need was left unmet a lot. And as a little girl, that was very hard to um, take in. And that left me with a lot of wounds. Unfortunately, at the age of eight, I was molested by a family member. At the time, I didn't tell anybody what happened. I was terrified of what the response would be, how I would be treated, or if I would honestly even be believed. So I kept it to myself. Um, shortly after the incident, my family decided to disconnect from this person for unrelated reasons. What they didn't realize at the time was what they were doing was helping me and protecting me from continued sexual abuse throughout my childhood. Um, even though the incident only happened once, it combined with not having my emotional needs met by my father was the perfect combination for me to start looking for love in all the wrong places. So as a young, not even teen yet, I started dating boy after boy after boy, heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. And this continued on throughout junior high. And the amazing thing was that I had some great friends who started to invite me to church. And so I came to know who Christ was and I gave my life to him. Unfortunately, my journey to come to know Christ was very a solo journey. My parents knew God, but did not go to church. When we were young kids, uh, very, very young, the church that they attended, two pastors in a row had affairs with their secretary and left their wives. So the hypocrisy was very hard for my parents to swallow. So they left the church and to this day have never returned. So my journey to come to know Christ was all on my own. And I never had that spiritual leader or spiritual guideship or discipleship that I so desired as a kid. And so I continued, even though I knew who Christ was, I continued making you know, dumb mistakes or not wise decisions. This continued into high school until I met the ministry. At the time, this looked like it was the answer to all of my problems. The, they had a pastor who was very involved with leadership and with the people, and he would guide them and disciple them and help them. I wanted in. They had something that looked very different, and it was very appealing to me. Looking back, I think what they had that I so desired was friendship and a love for Christ and dedication to Him that was unmatching to any church or community I'd ever been in. So I jumped in with both feet head first. I was all in. Um, to be in this ministry and to be in leadership, you had to sign what they call the covenant. In this covenant, you are agreeing to not date, not drink, um, not get tattoos, um, and you couldn't even listen to secular music of any kind. And it wasn't that we thought that if you were in leadership, you should hold yourself to a higher standard. It was more the fact that we thought anybody who partook in these kind of activities couldn't love Jesus, um, was sinful. We were very judgmental and thought we were holier than Jesus himself at times. Um, so I continued into this with this ministry for about five years. As time went on, I started to question. I started to see the red flags. Um, one of the bigger ones I saw was the disconnection. So I was in this ministry, but I was very disconnected from my family and from my friends who were outside the ministry. I started to see the abuse of ministry funds. I started to see the judgment, the shame, the ridicule that was not aligning with Jesus or the Bible. 
the biggest thing I started to see was I started to see the manipulation and control that the pastor had over many of the members. So a couple times I tried to leave. The thing that kept me coming back was the pastor would tell me, if you leave, you are sacrificing your parents and your family's opportunity to come to know Jesus. By me making this selfish decision to leave, I was ruining my parents' opportunity to sal of salvation. As a young adult, that weight was tremendous and I was unwilling to carry that burden. So I stayed. I came crawling back every single time. Um, thankfully, after five years of being in the ministry, I did an internship for college about four hours away from where this ministry took place. So for the summer, I was disconnected in a, in a small way and through a tremendous amount of small little ways and a beautiful long story, I met my husband and I met his entire family. Over the course of getting to know them and seeing their relationships with God and how beautiful it was, they helped me to see how toxic this relationship with this ministry was and how it didn't align with the Bible and how in reality it wasn't a ministry at all. It was actually a cult. So coming to that realization, I decided, all right, I'm leaving. Deciding to leave was a very big decision because my entire world was wrapped up in this ministry. The house I lived in at the time, the family's daughter was in the ministry. She was a member. The, ha the job I had, the boss was a ministry member. How I got into college was by the pastor. So not only was I leaving all of my friends and my church, I was literally losing my entire life that I had set up at that moment. But I knew this is what God had for me. I knew this is what felt right. I knew this is what aligned with the Bible. So I did it, I left. When I chose to leave, I was met with ridicule. I was told I was running away from the Lord. I was told I was jumping off the deep end. I was told I couldn't hear from the Lord. Um, my husband, the pastor told me that my husband was just an old man after young booty. We were five years different in age. <laughs> um, we were, I was told my marriage was going to fail and I would come crawling back. So I had to deal with a lot of those emotions and still stand firm and this is who I know Christ is. Thankfully, I had my husband's family to help me walk through this and process and see what a healthy relationship looks like, see what a healthy church looks like, what discipleship really is supposed to be like. So I left. In reality, it's so beautiful because they were all wrong. <laughs> we, My husband and I have now been married for nine years. And throughout these nine years, God has used our marriage in miraculous ways to help speak into young girls' lives, to help other married couples. And it has even helped a, a mom leave a very unhealthy relationship. So I look back and I just thank God that I made that decision to leave and that I trusted Him. And the thing that, that blows me away every time is seeing the Lord's kindness in not leaving us in our brokenness. And over these last nine years, he has taken me on an amazing healing journey, not only from the emotional abuse from the cult, but also healing me from my child abuse. It took me nine years to share this story this year. Um, and it took me 22 years to even tell my parents what happened to me as a child. So 2020 has been crazy for everybody. But for me, it has been the year of healing that I have so long awaited for. And it has brought me to the point where I can tell you guys this story and share it without feeling shame, without feeling judgment or ridicule, and actually seeing and being proud of who Christ has made me to be and what He has taken me from, and to help others see that the Lord's kindness, He's not gonna leave you in your brokenness. He's not gonna leave you in your shame. And no matter how long it takes, He's there to hold your hand and to walk you through and to get your healing journey complete.
Lacey, thank you so much for sharing that amazing story with us. What an honor. And if you're watching this and you're thinking, I want that same kind of hope and healing that Lacey experienced at the end of this video, we're going to have a time of prayer and we're going to believe God is going to move in your life. Our next testimony comes from a gentleman in the church. His name is Steve Brown. My name's Steve. Uh, I am a broken vessel and uh, I've... I've been the prodigal more than once in my life. Started off, I was raised in church, kind of like uh, Pastor Roger, it was the mean church. And uh, as Pastor Roger said one time, I brought back from my childhood, they used to not like sex or not, not want you to have sex because they thought it might lead to dancing, right? That was the kind of mentality. Um, it was kind of funny. But um, I, I was raised in church from the time I was little, and I lived across the street from our church and across the street from our pastor. And so we were, we just kind of lived that experience. And when I was 16, I accepted Christ for real, you know, for the first time. I was really, really dedicating my life to Him at that point. And we, uh, we had a youth group with about four or five of us that were really on fire for God. And we, we got together and we did Bible studies. When a lot of kids were just messing around, we were still getting together and talking about the things of God. The pastor said that he could see the calling on my life to the ministry. Um, other people did too. I was 16 when this was going on. My mom got sick. when I was 17 and she was diagnosed in the summertime and she died in the fall and pretty much changed life. We had a lot of, a lot of times praying around her bed. I remember her trying to get up and walk. She had a bad hip. Um, cancer had gotten in there through uh, it was a melanoma and uh, the cancer got in there and started eating on her bones on her hips and joints and uh, I remember her praying she had so much faith that she would get up and this is the time God's healed me she would try to walk and she just kept getting weaker and that was really tough for me because I was serving a God that I knew could. I I had known <clears throat> I had known so many people that had stories of miracles, and she never got one. Life changed. It got it got really hard. I had two younger sisters. Uh, one was six and one was 12. I, um, my dad worked swing shift, so he left about an hour before the girls got home and he got home about an hour after they went to bed. So I became mom and dad for all intents and purposes. I did that for about two years and it kind of it kind of sidelined me. I still loved the Lord. I was still very involved in church. I ended up joining the Navy. Uh, when I got there I, in boot camp, I worked in the chapel. I, you could volunteer for all these different duties, and I worked in the chapel and worked with sound and lights and different things like that at the church. And I was still focused that direction. When I got to the submarine in San Diego. We had a bunch of guys on the boat that had a, a Bible study. And uh, I went to the Bible study. I was all in. And one of the guys on the boat went to a church in San Diego that uh, he, he kept inviting me to go to that church. And 
I felt like I just needed a little bit of a break. A little bit of a break. It, I didn't want much, but I wanted a break. And um, so I didn't go with him for a week and then another week and then another week. And what ended up happening was I, I got in with some of the guys in the barracks and hey, let's go out on Saturday night. So with those guys, it was a break. So we ended up going out and doing a lot of stupid stuff. A lot of stupid stuff. These were tough guy type of guys that liked to fight back in the 80s, coming out of the 60s, 70s and whatnot into the 80s. There were a lot of people that had a roadhouse type mentality, go get in a fight for no reason at all. That was those guys. I remember the first person that I really hurt. I remember the look on his face. It was kind of horrific. It was really horrific. And um, he didn't deserve that. Spent most of my time in the Navy away from God. I quit reading my Bible, quit thinking about the things of God. Our, our ship went up to Bremerton, Washington. This is interesting how the Lord brings things around. Um, in Bremerton, my uncle worked at the shipyard. And he said, hey, why don't you take a room with me? And he was, he had gone to Bible school and he ministered a lot, ministered a lot through service. And um, so I went and started staying with my uncle started going to church with him, met my first wife, found out later that she had actually gone to the church that I'd been invited to in San Diego, ended up serving in the church a little bit up there. And then uh, we got married. I came back to Nampa. We served in the church. Same pastor that thought I was called to the ministry. He didn't know anything about all this, all the garbage that I'd done. He, when I came back home, I was serving God. And through some interesting type of things, our church got really deceived into running him out of the church. That was a whole different thing. Similar to my mom dying, that was, um, it was another blow. How could a church do this to a, a great man who's serving. All he wanted to do was serve that church. My wife and I got hurt pretty bad through all that. So we walked away again. She and I had both had our time earlier in life where we were away and we turned our back again through a whole bunch of stupidity. We ended up divorced on our own and pretty desolate. Wondering how in the world I messed up everything so bad again. And the Lord sends a guy into ITD. I start working for ITD. And here come all of these behaviors that pop back up. I wasn't living for the Lord and it was just all out again. And this is one guy coming transferred in from Mount Pillar. He was sent from God. But I was just starting to kind of put my feet back in the water into church. And Ron shows up at ITD and I didn't know what he was needing, but he kept challenging me. And I, I remember saying one time, I don't even feel worthy to, to be in this group of people worshiping the Lord. And he goes, yeah, well, that's because you're not. And it hit me so hard. It's like, yeah, I know that. I've always known that. I'm not worthy, but the Lord accepts us in. He wants us here. He doesn't necessarily need us. He wants us.
In our conversations, in my conversations with Ron, he let me know later I saved his marriage. Some of the words that I spoke that the Lord was giving me from time to time, I knew some of them hit him hard. But um, the Lord used my voice through all of the times that I was away. I could point to a f- quite a few stories where the Lord used my voice to change someone else's life, even though I wasn't living for him. You know, I, f- I, finally, I finally figured it out that nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm a broken vessel. I'm absolutely a broken vessel. I had a cousin that went into the hospital and she had had a hard life and she was in the hospital for some of the things that her her body was damaged because of some of the chemicals and things she'd taken. And um, when I went to see her, she'd been 10 days non-responsive. My other cousin was there and she had, she told me that they're basically making her comfortable until she passes. Well, what she didn't know is three days before that, the Lord had told me, go pray for her and she will be healed. I had no faith. This wasn't me, but I kept on thinking, well, that's just you. You're, you're raised in church and you're churchy and stuff. And maybe you're thinking that if you do this thing, it'll happen and so stop it just stop it well that voice kept coming back go pray for her and she'll be healed and finally three days later I finally went up to the hospital and I'm confronting a cousin that used to intimidate me so much and here's my other cousin laying here non-responsive intubated and all the stuff and I told them We're praying for you. I've got prayer requests in. I know people that are in different countries. I said, literally, we're praying for you all over the world. And we have faith that she's going to be healed. And I still, standing in the the hospital room, I didn't pray for her. I told them we're going to pray for her, but I didn't pray for her. So I ended up leaving and I walked out and I was about to push the button for the elevator. And that little voice comes back and said, that's not what I told you to do. I told you to pray for her. I didn't tell you to tell them you're praying for her. And I ended up in my car. This is how hard of hearing I am, how hard headed and stupid sometimes. I end up in my car with the key in the ignition. And that voice is saying, go back up and pray for her. She will be healed. So I finally went back up and I said, to my cousin that I had trouble facing. I said, I've been unfaithful to God. I've just disobeyed God. And she thought I was crazy because she doesn't think that way. (laughs) And um, I bent over and I said, Carla, in the name of Jesus, be healed. That was it. There was no fancy nothing. And she opened her eyes and started choking on the intubation tube. And the nurses come in, my cousin went, oh my gosh, and there's all of a sudden a flurry activity around her bed, and a day and a half later, she walked out of the hospital. I think God used my obedience to help my cousin. She did accept the Lord, amen, and The Lord is glorified in some of this stuff, even though sometimes we're too dumb to to really stick it through and do it right. I mean, I've known since I was 16, I've known how to live. I've known every single time that I walked away, I knew, but I did it anyway. You know, some some vessels the, the potter makes from nice good clay and he has to turn it one time, fires it, and it's pretty good. Other vessels uh, end up getting cracked or broken, dry spots, whatever it is. And do you know, when you make a vessel that's broken or you have a vessel that's broken, you can re-break it, smash it down, 
pulverize it into dust and then add water again and make a new vessel. Steve, thank you for sharing your journey with us. What a powerful story. I love this idea that uh, the God does not just throw us away. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he which began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And even when we feel like we have gone too far or we failed too much, God isn't done with us yet. So right now, wherever you are, um, if one of these stories spoke to you, uh, I just want you to receive right now. I want to pray for you. Pray God's blessing in your life. Lord Jesus, as we've heard these stories of you keeping these, of healing these, and uh, redeeming these three people, God, we turn towards you. Lord, your spirit, which is not bound by walls, it's not bound by location. I'm asking right now that your spirit would move into homes where this is being watched and into, into hearts where this is being felt right now. Lord, that we, would, that we would receive the spirit of what you're doing in this place. God, your word says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and that the righteous run into it and are safe. So right now we call on the name of Jesus. Would you do that right now where you are? Would you call on the name of Jesus? Lord, I pray that you'd heal, that you'd strengthen. God, that you would deliver because you are a God that still heals, that still strengthens, and that still delivers. Let me say this, if you were watching this video and as, you, as you've watched it, you just thought, I need to get right with God. There's something inside of me that just says, I, I feel like I'm far from him and I want to be close to him. Listen, what that is, is that's the spirit of God drawing you to him right now. So I'm gonna ask you to respond. The way we respond to him drawing us is really simple. We're going to repent and believe. Repent means we're gonna turn away from the things that we know don't please God. And more importantly, we're gonna turn away from the way we think that doesn't please God. And then we're going to believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that saves us and cleanses us from all sin. So right now, if you're ready to receive the Lord, why don't you repent and believe with me? something like this. God, I'm sorry for the things in my life that I know don't please you. Would you forgive me? Right now I repent. God, I'm turning away from the things in my life that I don't want to do. And more importantly, I'm turning away from the way I thought, especially the way I thought about you. I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for me, was buried and rose again, and that when I have faith in him, that I am counted as righteous before God. So right now, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, and I'll follow you every day that I live. That decision you just made is probably the best decision you've ever made. Never underestimate the power of a decision. Because within the decision you just made, you have the power to overcome. You are now more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved you. And it may not be long until you're able to share your story about what God has done in your life. All right, church family, it's that time. It's benediction time. Why don't you say this with me? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.